Hey guys, let me tell you about the Santa Fe industry leading peace of mind warranty, a full five year replacement plus one year on parts. These are fantastic units. I use these on all my houses under construction. I'm a really big fan of Santa Fe. I'm Jake Bruton with Aero Building in Columbia, Missouri in the Kansas City Metro market. And today we're actually just outside Columbia at uh, what we're calling our Redo Aero House. Let's talk about why we're building a house next to a house. And what is that thing? Let's do it now. Okay, so one of the few places that my uh, libertarian ideas kind of devolve is when it comes to building code and code enforcement. I know that that's a really health and safety thing and I'm okay with all that, but I also feel like it's one of the places that people get scammed and I think that's what happened here. Whether or not the builder had the intention to get one over on somebody or not, I don't know. I don't know the builder. I don't even know his name. I didn't ask because it's not important to me. But let's talk about the house that's behind me. So this uh, wedge-shaped house that is behind me uh, was built in 2012, 2013, somewhere in there. Uh, I might not have everything exactly correct, but I trust me, I have the, the overarching story correct here. That house is about 10 to 12 or 10 to 11 years old. The clients paid to have a custom home built, 700 square foot house, the garage and some space above the garage that could someday be expanded into. And when they first contacted me in say 2019, we kind of came to the conclusion pretty quick that that part was going to be difficult for us to save. So let's talk about everything that's wrong with it. And then we'll talk about the house that we're building so that you can, I can bring you up to speed on this redo arrow house. That house, the footings are too narrow and not deep enough. So the concrete foundation is not large enough to support that building, that structure, or properly support it. Uh, obviously it's supporting it on some level because it's not completely on the ground or anything, but it does not meet code minimums. It's not deep enough for our market. It has some serious seasonal movement for just a slab on grade. Number two, the concrete slab was poured in, I think four parts, uh, if I'm correct. Uh, it's 700 square feet and has a garage attached to it. That's one pour for most people. Well, they have some heaving, they have some sagging, things weren't properly adhered to each other, and they have some pretty serious separation inside. There are points where you can put your hand down inside the foundation. Uh, now, they're not experiencing any moisture coming up from in there or anything like that, but they certainly are getting soil gas. Uh, they certainly are getting um, some neighbors moving in, if you might say. Uh, things that could get underneath there could easily get into the house. Um, and from a slab perspective, there is absolutely no insulation underneath there. Now, code-wise, when this was built, uh, that's not required. In fact, code-wise, in most of the market that we compete in, and the Columbia side of our things, doesn't require slab insulation. It requires a four feet out from the perimeter in slab insulation. So even that center of the foundation on this thing would still be completely uninsulated in our market if we were doing the code minimum or what the code allows. So we have an uninsulated slab that's poured in too many pieces on too small of a footing. So therefore we have a foundation that doesn't support our building, that isn't comfortable, that has issues. And I believe it also doesn't have a vapor barrier underneath of it because I've been in there and it felt a little damp from time to time. Uh, okay, so let's move beyond foundation, let's talk framing. I've actually been in the unfinished part of the attic because they were looking at trying to finish that at some point. It's actually framed fairly well. Like it looks to me like the people that did the framing up there knew what they were doing and were paying close attention. So it looks to me like they had framers on site uh, that really cared. They just didn't have the correct start with their, with their uh, foundation. Uh, so let's talk siding and windows next. Uh, building envelope is something that's incredibly important, right? Like we're gonna try to keep air and water and thermal and all that outside the envelope. They're doing a really bad job about that here. Uh, they do have a two by six wall because the clients were directing some of the choices that they made. Uh, at the time they were uneducated when it comes to exterior insulation. So you can see there's a little bit of zip behind me we'll get to in a minute. If the house is a zip uh, on a two by six which a lot of markets would still to this day consider to be a, an upgraded uh, system. However, none of the windows have head flashings. The windows 
are not taped in place. They're just mounted. Uh, they do have uh, a couple windows on this end that never got cut out uh, that we'll get to in a second as well. So those windows are not properly flashed. They don't have head flashings. They're adhered directly to the face of the zip. And then the siding is adhered directly over top of that, which causes a problem because we have a four foot by nine foot panel that is completely uh, against the zip. Meaning when we have water held in tension issues with like say a board and batten, which would traditionally be like 12 or 16 inches wide or a lap siding, which would be every eight inches, there's a point of contact and then there's opportunity for drying and drainage between those. This system doesn't have any of that. We have two fully adhered boards where if something gets behind at the top, it has nine feet that it has to travel before it finds an opportunity to exit or get stay behind another board. So your water held in tension on this assembly is astronomical compared to what a normal piece of siding would be. So this is like a worst case scenario, water held in tension against the zip. They're having water intrusion at every window, which then causes mold and mildew and indoor air quality issues. And actually just for them to continue living over there, we've recommended that we go ahead and put in an ERV so that we get a little more turnover with the air. It might be kind of hard to see, but every time you come here, that front window is propped open because that's the best way for them to get some fresh air inside and not have to worry about indoor air quality anywhere near as much. So they're looking for dilution with that front door or that front window being open. And I promise you, Every time I've come here, that window has been at least cracked. They're moving a little bit of air that way every day. So we have foundation, the framing's okay, the envelope's in a bad shape, and then they have indoor air qualities that I just alluded to. It's very difficult to, after the fact, deal with indoor air qualities. You have to basically dilute by leaving that window open, like we were saying. So we have challenges that are just building upon each other that made saving that structure as our primary living space, a very difficult thing to do. Obviously, if it's a 700 square foot house, they're very uh, conservative on the size that they need. So we have a new house that's coming in. This is a project with Steve Basic and I. Uh, this new house is a um, 1700 square feet, solve all their problems kind of uh, situation. We have three bedrooms, uh, two full baths, uh, a really nice, Kohler soaking tub, uh, tile showers, custom cabinets, European windows, air quality issues will not be a concern, energy efficiency will not be a concern, and I think the current idea is that we're not going to trash that building. There's going to be some renovation that takes place to make that look a little more conservative like what we're building. Maybe we're going to reframe the roof assembly so we don't have this wedge shape anymore but there's gonna be some attention given to over there and that will be maintained maybe as a periodic guest space or some sort of storage barn for some of the farming that they do here on site uh, or some of the uh, extensive gardening that they do here on site. Uh, but that building's not just gonna get scraped from the earth and thrown away. That's just as bad as the fact that, that you know, that's, that's just as bad as it being bad in the first place. Us just throwing it away and it being a total waste makes things worse. So. Let's talk about this ridiculously tall wall of zip. For whatever reason, the clients parted way with the contractor before things were finished. And that wall, which is east facing, has been exposed like that since uh, 2012, 2013. So that thing is coming up on 10 years. So like I said, I've been in the upstairs up there. Uh, there are a couple things that were done incorrectly with this. The tape was rolled really well. Uh, it is stapled on the wall instead of being nailed. Nailing abides by the APA, I think it's APA 30, I might have to look that up, uh, standard for how it's supposed to be installed on roofs. But I think that Huber actually at this point was still recommending not using staples. Um, so it does have staples and I would make an argument that two penetrations are worse than one. Um, it's in good shape. I've been upstairs, I've looked at a couple of the spots where there are windows that need to be cut out. There are a couple really small leaks, but nothing that is concerning or nothing that I would be worried about, but it has unlimited drying and it's held up to the UV. So if we could just 
pretend that this had a rain screen and siding where we have pretty much unlimited drying, we wouldn't have any concerns, right? Like, even if it wasn't installed properly, the tape was rolled, it's gonna be okay. We would have no issues over here probably where there is siding, had that siding been installed on a rain screen uh, instead of just a nine foot by four foot uh, water held in tension point. So I think there's a couple lessons to be learned from, from this. Uh, first and foremost, having an engineer or a certified architect on your team and willing to poke their head in uh, as a checks and balances for the architect or for the builder if there's no code enforcement, which in this market there is no code enforcement. We're outside, we're outside of our home county, we're outside of our home city, so we're in a county nearby that doesn't have code enforcement. So you need some sort of checks and balance. Either the third party inspector, you need an architect or an engineer that are willing to poke their head ends, something of the sort for checks and balances for your builder. Number two, you have to find somebody that understands the risk of what they're doing. And by that, I mean, I would never decide to mate a four foot by nine foot to a four foot by nine foot piece of sheathing and think for a second that that was gonna be a good idea. Yeah, you might have a four foot by nine foot piece where water's not gonna get behind it, but everywhere on that perimeter, that uh, 27 feet or whatever it is that is the perimeter of that sucker, if water gets in there, now it's stuck behind a four foot by nine foot panel and it's held in tension. And that's really something that could cause problems. Um, and three, I think um, we, have to, we have to promote uh, building code and the enforcement of building code because it is there to protect people. I realize that a lot of people go, ah, you know, it's my house, I should be able to build what I want. I agree to some level, however, these people effectively uh, spent money on something that is not gonna be their house. And I'm sure that they spent a good sum of money to build that with a custom design and with their builder saying he could build them a custom home and choosing some of the expensive finishes that they used. And all of that is effectively a waste. And now we're gonna do a redo. Now we're starting over, now we're rebuilding. Uh, so. I think that we should learn from things like this. We should hope that it doesn't happen to us. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy that these clients have recognized what's going on and are willing to try to do things the right way. I'm very proud of them for taking that stance because I'm sure that that was an incredibly difficult thing to do. And I'm not just saying that because I don't think they might see this because I don't think they will see this because I don't think they watch. So um, stay tuned for this redo house. Follow that hashtag. We'll do some stuff real soon on the foundation here. It's a good detail that I think people can see. Uh, fully insulated yet concrete floor. Uh, we have some really cool fixtures here. We have some really cool European windows here. There's gonna be a lot of stuff here that we can share and learn from and try to avoid doing that again. So until next time, don't forget to sign up for the newsletter. There are like 12 videos every week. If you're not getting the newsletter, you might miss something. It's my preferred way to keep up with everything. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram. Don't forget to check out the Unbuild It podcast. Steve Basic, Peter Yost, and myself talking building, building business, and building science uh, every Thursday. It's a great uh, podcast, or we think it's a great podcast. And until next time, have a nice day. Thanks for watching.